uh, catching you up if you were not um, with us yesterday. You were told a moment ago that this really is the, the second part of um, a two-part presentation on change. Let's talk about change for a moment just, just in terms of, of the responsibility God has put on each of us personally in Christian living. It seems not to threaten us to hear the call for change to be made in our personal Christian lives. Most of us understand that the goal of the kingdom of God is always out here to be pursued. Paul, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we understand that's going to call us constantly to change and renewal. It's going to call us to penitence. It's going to call us to growth. It's going to call us to deepening our spirituality. And yet it sometimes threatens us when we hear the same call made to the church that we hear made without a sense of threat to us as persons. But when you reflect on the fact that the church is the aggregate of the persons, the church is that called out body of people, then you really hear some dissonance in saying, well, I understand my personal need to change, but I resent anybody saying, uh, I just resist anybody saying that anything about the church needs to change. Well, I think, I think you hear that dissonance. If you and I are changing and growing and becoming more suited as vessels for God, then the church is going to be changing and adapting. One of my favorite theologians, is um, the Reverend Will Be Done. Uh, if, you, if you don't know him, you can read him rather regularly in the funny papers. Um, the, the comic strip is Kudzu, drawn by a fellow named Doug Marlette. If, if he did not spend some of his early life either as the son of a minister or as a minister, or, or with someone who was very close to him who was a minister, I, I will be greatly surprised. I mean, you, you read that and, and you get a lot of insight into the life of someone who is in ministry and, and some fairly responsible theology there. One day he says, I think what the psalmist is so eloquently and poetically trying to suggest here is that if we don't change our ways, we're dead meat. Um, well, you know, that, that is in the biblical text, isn't it? Uh, Hebrews 6 calls us not to keep laying again the foundations, but, but to press on from these basic things to the things for which God has called us. Well, he followed up one day on, on this theme, and uh, he was concerned in his prayer, whoops, Lord... Smite mine enemies, Lord, and with increasing passion and fervor. Smite them. Smite mine own worst enemy. Whap! A bolt answers out of the blue, and he says, let me rephrase that. The bolt having struck him straight on and having curled his hair. Well, that's what I think has happened in my life when I have prayed for God to make me more sensitive to Him, more open to His Spirit, more useful for His purposes. Lord, whatever obstacle is in my way, move it. Smite the enemy that's in the path of this spiritual progress. And so God does. And God has to break and, and, and humble and take one down a notch or two to realize more often than not, we are our own worst enemies in spiritual things. Well, again, I repeat, what's true of the individual is true of the corporate entity, the church. Change is not only a constant part of daily life in the world. Quill pens give way to lead pencils, give way to typewriters, give way to computers. It's also an integral part in Christian experience. If we're growing into Christ's likeness, we're always always being called to change. And if we're addressing the needs of our changing world as the body of Christ, the church is always changing. The question really is not, shall we change? The question is, will we direct that change in appropriate ways? Will we have some control over that change so that it's in the right direction rather than the wrong direction, so that 
theologically and practically we are better and stronger for the change rather than simply being caught in the currents of change and allowing the culture to take us where it's going. I don't want to go where the culture is going because the culture is typically set against God. So the call to change is really the call of God and the threat involved in change is the threat to our false securities our false ways and our false pride. We do well to address these words of God to ancient Israel to today's church. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, I'll heal their churches. Um, the church has never been where God wanted it to be. That is, the church has never realized its potential. The church has never accomplished all that God wanted it to accomplish. The church is marred by the flawedness of those of us who make it up. It is a divine human enterprise. Divine because it's called into being by God, but human because it's made up of redeemed sinners. So yesterday, I started talking about this theme of change and our trying to have some clear indication of the direction the change needs to go by citing statements. And we, we dealt with two of those yesterday and we'll deal with a third today. The first statement, someone care to remind us who was here? Walmart. Walmart is my favorite store. Thank you. See? So profound a quotation. The second statement, so overdo everything. Old men underdo everything. Okay. And now the third statement, the one where we pick up, and the one that really I hope will be the biblical summation and will pull into focus. We're going to shift into specifics of some of the areas of change that we simply must address. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at 19. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, parenthesis, though I myself am not un under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, parenthesis, though I'm not free from... So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of his blessings. Now the part of that quote that I cited earlier was the 22nd verse. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. Now you could read that in a sinister way and you could say, yeah, Paul was sort of a chameleon type. Paul didn't have any convictions. Paul didn't know where he stood on anything. So wherever Paul was, he was just sort of like a wind vane and, and he, would, um, he would just be turned by the curl. And that's certainly not fair to what Paul is saying here. Paul's not saying, now, wherever I was, I just adopted the mores and the values of those people and of those groups. Paul had a singular message and a singular focus. It's the gospel. I determined not to know anything Christ and him crucified. Paul had the things nailed down that were at the center and heart of his theology. Paul's mission was to preach Christ. But Paul says... Let's talk methodologies for a moment. I, I'm not talking my theology, that my theology is fickle, that, that I'll get my theology from reading my audience, that if, ooh, if they don't like me talking about repentance, I'll back off and say, no, you're fine just as you are, and if, and if they don't like me saying this, I'll quit. That's not what Paul is saying. All things to all men here is not a sort of theological fickleness, a, a sort of chameleon character. This is methodology. Paul says, you know, I have a single message to communicate, but what I've discovered is the message has to be communicated appropriately to the audience. And so to Jews and non-Jews, to the weak, to those not under the law, he says, well, you could just go down the list. I try to address the message to the audience in an appropriate way so that really I try to become all things to all men. Any good communicator does that. Jesus did that. 
Jesus did not talk to the common folk in the same language or around the same themes that he talked to the establishment. In fact, he even adopted a different tone of voice, not just content. You know of Paul's ability because of the way he was trained, Jewish in ethnic origin and, and, and basic life commitments and yet growing up in a cosmopolitan city with the benefit of, of Hellenistic education, Paul could preach both at Athens and Corinth and, and in Jerusalem. So Paul is a good one to model the thesis here that, look, there is in fact the demand to make some changes in approach and methodology, not the message, not the theology. But there is a requirement to realize that, that the changing circumstance, the changing culture, the changing ethnic and other values and, and backgrounds of the people you're approaching, those things require that you do some changing in the way you do business in packaging what's going on. And that's a biblical statement was the gospel, but his methodology was always evolving. I, I don't like change. I, I admitted that yesterday. I think I'm fairly typical as a human being, maybe even more fairly typical as a husband. I don't like things changed, wall colors, furniture placement. I don't like things changed. I'm a creature of habit. But I have become an unabashed agent for change in the way people is doing business because I have another transparency somewhere. I don't have it with me. If we keep doing the same things we've always done, we'll keep getting the same results we are now getting. And the results we're now getting are not particularly impressive. We're not doing a very good job in communication. The message that we have to communicate, I'm convinced, is right. The message of Christ, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But the culture that we live in is not the culture I grew up in. Some years ago, I went, to, went back to school to study philosophy. And the reason I went back to study philosophy was not to try to find the answers to life's ultimate questions. I went back to try to understand the mindset of the time that I was addressing. Not sure I've ever told anybody this in a public setting. Really hadn't meant to here, but, but I think it, it fits. I'd been preaching for a number of years, and, and I could be well-received among folks who had the same background I had. People who had grown up in the Church of Christ appreciated the sermons I preached, and I could, I could preach them and, and get a hearing. But I couldn't communicate to people whose background was different from my own, even people who, who were believers, who'd grown up studying Scripture, and I certainly couldn't communicate to pe with people whose background did not have anything theological or basically very conservative theological Christian. And yet my heart's desire was genuine. I wanted so that people could learn of Christ and come to him. So I went back to school to study philosophy so that I would understand, I hoped, something better of the mindset of the audience to which I was preaching in this generation. And the first year of that study was about the most unsettling thing in my life. It made me realize that for years I'd been doing a counterproductive thing, not only a non-productive thing, I'd already realized that, but a counterproductive thing. Because given my background, I wanted to start so far along the path here, away from ground zero, with so many assumptions. I basically wanted everybody to, all, to, to be assumed to have my background, my set of concerns and issues. I wanted to start here, and they were way back here. And I don't mean intellectually behind. I just mean in terms of where their starting points were. And it has been a struggle of my life to learn how to communicate to a larger audience the message of Christ and not just those people who are already just like me. I don't know that there's any particular value to my life to be able to communicate to people who already are just like me. Now, that's a comfortable thing to do, and it's a very affirming thing to do. But the call of Christianity is not to stay within a comfort zone of talking to the people who are already like you and who are already believing what you... to become all things to all people so that understanding and appreciating where active communication to bring them to Christ. What does that mean in terms of practical things. What are the significant points of tension and change that emerge when that happens? I want to suggest seven if we have time. Number one, there must be a fundamental theological shift of emphasis 
from the church to Christ. Now, you've got to let me explain what I mean by that lest you misunderstand it or, or be offended by it or, or misrepresent it. By saying that our shift must be away from the church to Christ, I do not mean to denigrate the church. The church is the body of Christ on earth. The church is a part of God's plan for the redemption of humankind. The church is the place where faith is nurtured and developed among those who are believers, and the church is the outreach base for God's work of evangelizing and caring and loving and implementing justice in the world. The church is critical. The church is essential. The church is blood-bought. The church is that important to God that it was purchased by the blood of Christ. What I mean by saying there must be a fundamental sh uh, theological shift of emphasis is that we must realize that the point of beginning in our attempts to communicate with the world must not be the church, but Christ who is the head of the church and who legitimates the church and who calls the church into being. At a practical level, here's what that means, among other things. A great deal of the energy and focus of our fellowship historically has been to prove we're the right church. Because 150, 200 years ago, the issue in American Christendom was which church is the best church? Stone and others believed that the sectarian divisions obey the strength of the calling of Jesus. And so they attempted to mark out boundaries, non-sectarian boundaries, where Christians could stand together with a commitment to Christ and not to lesser things, not to creeds and human names and institutions. Two or three generations removed from the beginning of that call, it became too very sectarianized in many ways, but that's another issue for another day. But that plea was framed at a time in history where the real issue in religion was, which is the best church, which is the best place to try to reach for God. Today, the issue is less which is the right church, and the issue is more why church at all. Since the Jesus movement, for example, Christianity has been presented to a lot of people as a home correspondence course in salvation. And the role of the church has basically been just swept away. Well, Jesus I know, but the church, who cares? Jesus is important. Jesus, yes, the church, no. Now, that's not biblical. But today, in order to communicate the importance of the church, you can't start by arguing which church. You have to start by exalting Jesus Christ and who he is. You have to show them the head before the body is seen to make any sense. The body is not a self-selling item to an unbelieving world. But if Christ as head is presented in his beauty, his power, his strength, his glory, and his redemptive abilities, then the church makes sense, and only then does the church make sense. But our beginning point in doing a lot of our theology still is to make some claims often very arrogant and unjustified about the church and about our fellowship in particular. I'm covering the front of this because it's a church bulletin that I received through the mail just a few weeks back. Most church, a lot of church bulletins and that you know as well as I do have outside covers printed and, and that stays the same. So on the front there will be probably a picture of the church building and the minister's name and so on and on the back cover maybe it's time of services and then the mailing label and what changes is only on the inside. Well, this is one of those church bulletins where the outside is a preprint. And the outside back cover, here is the preprint. The title is The Church of Christ. We would like for you to make a careful comparison of this church with the one described in detail in your Bible. We believe that you will find that this church is not similar to, but is identical in every way to the church you read about in the New Testament. Now, that's maybe a little more crass than, than sometimes we have approached the doing of our theology, but it's, it, it summarizes what has been the emphasis. The emphasis has been, the understanding of restorationism that has come to be popular is that our claim must be that we are exactly what that was, that we have restored, that we are, as they say, in every detail exactly what that church was. And which one of those churches? 
Jerusalem with its lack of evangelistic, with its drunkenness and incest and divisions, you know, make a better case for Corinth than some of the others maybe in, in some places. And it, it does not communicate well. It does not communicate well to try to sell the idea that's fundamentally false. that we are everything we're supposed to be. We're not. I'm not everything I'm supposed to be, and you're not everything you're supposed to be. No, would any one of you make the arrogant claim about yourself that you're everything that you ought to be under God? Well, if the church is the composite of all of us, how dare we? How dare we be so arrogant as to say that we as a fellowship of people are in every detail what the church of the New Testament is called to be. We are not. I believe we have as good a hope as any place because of our non-denominational plea, at least the plea, not always the implementation, but the non-denominational plea and the congregational autonomy motif that we've affirmed theologically to be correct and, and that we've tried to, to maintain, again, at least in, in theory, if not in practice. If for those two reasons alone we do not have as good a chance of being a place where one could realize the life of being a believer in community. I, I, I don't know where the better alternative is, or I, I'd probably go to it. I'd want to be part of it. I am fully content with this fellowship if this fellowship is confessional about its true nature. I am not content with our making a claim that's false about ourselves one that cannot be vindicated, one that cannot be defended without our adopting a posture that makes us both spiritually and intellectually absurd in the eyes and ears of our hearers. So the beginning of theological emphasis must not be, as, as we have traditionally, sort of like in this statement put it, ecclesiology, the church, we are what the church is supposed to be, but the beginning of our theology must be with Christ, him crucified, calling people together for his redemption and making us into a church that can confess. Now, we're not all we need to be and we're not where we want to be and where we're looking to go and where God has called us to be. But we are a confessional, nurturing, non-denominational fellowship attempting to reach for that kingdom goal God has put before us. I think that's one of the fundamental shifts of emphasis in theology that, that is happening and that must happen and, and that attention must be called to so that it's a very deliberate change that we make away from something that, that not only does not communicate but is not true about ourselves, but what we must and can say about Christ and be absolutely true and say with integrity. I read a while back uh, an anecdote, and surely it was, it was fraudulent as to truthfulness and yet revealing as to, as to content. The church supposedly had a sign out front that said, Jesus only. And after a storm had blown away two or three letters, the sign now read with the J-E-S gone, us only. Well, there's a world of difference between the two claims. Perception is a large part of reality when it comes to communication. And in the places where we are known best, what are we heard to be saying about ourselves? Jesus only or us only? Number two, there must be a fundamental emphasis shift in our theology away from law to gospel. Paul talked about law, and he said, you know, when I'm among people who are not under law, perhaps here the law, law of Moses, Jews, he says, when I'm among those pagans, those Gentiles who don't have it, I come to them as one not under law, parenthesis, but, but of course I'm under the law of Christ, so let me put the same parenthetical insertion here. When I say there must be a shift of emphasis from law to gospel, am I wanting to say that there is no law, there is no accountability in Christian life, there are no demands to discipleship, there are no conditions to salvation? Absolutely not. 
The question is, where does the beginning point for teaching and emphasis come? Well, historically, I think among conservatives and fundamentalists generally, the emphasis has been on law. I certainly know that law rather than gospel, and that's why we have at times produced a sort of uh, spiritual neuroticism among our very best people who are concerned that they cannot measure up, they cannot do enough, they cannot be close enough to God to have any hope of being saved. Some of the very best people that I know Preachers, elders, godly Christian men and women have died thinking, I hope I've done enough. God has never called us to do enough to be saved. We can't. Well, that indicates to me that there has been something in our preaching emphasis, whether we've intended it or not, that has had us majoring not in gospel, the good news that redemption is by God's grace through Christ but that the emphasis at least as heard, surely not as intended, but the emphasis as heard is law that says, as the Pharisees had come to interpret the law of Moses, though the law of Moses was a grace system, it didn't offer salvation by climbing the rungs. That's what the Pharisees had made the law into. That's what some of us have done with the New Testament. We've made it into law, climbing rungs, taking enough appropriate steps, outrunning the devil from the baptistry of the pearly gates hoping that we will, in fact, not uh, die by having a car wreck on the freeway where the right front, front tire blows out and we flip off a mountain and as the flipping goes on, you know, we, we say a dirty word, smack a tree and die and go to hell. And don't tell me that no one here has ever dealt with fears of that nature or I'd think you'd lie to me about something else too. One of the classic pieces of literature in our restoration heritage is a book by T.W. Brent. It's called The Gospel Plan of Salvation. The book is, is a big, thick tome, over 600 pages, a lot of good information, valuable stuff in there. I don't know if it reflects or if it sets something of the theological emphasis on this point of shifting from law to gospel. But the word cross, the word, just the word cross, appears in that 600-page book one time. And the layout of the book, Gospel Plan of Salvation, want to guess what the layout of the book is? Yeah, five steps. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. If, in fact, in the churches that... that at least I grew up call for change is really not appropriate in this part of the country. That's provincial in Middle Tennessee. It's not that way in our fellowship in other parts of the country. If none of this applies to your experience and to your setting, you know, just say, well, he's talking only a Middle Tennessee experience. It doesn't apply. So you, you're, you're free to dismiss it if, it, if it's irrelevant, as, as he thought it was. Um, in the part of the country where I grew up, if there was going to be a gospel meeting and if it was going to have five nights, you know what the five sermons would have been? Exactly. Now, if it was a six-night meeting, when, if it ran Sunday night through Friday night, you'd begin on Sunday, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and what would the sixth night be? Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death. Okay? Discipleship would be some... Now, are those topics appropriate? Are those topics theologically sound? Yes, but you can preach those five or six steps and never preach gospel. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized are gospel responses. If you preach the gospel, what would you preach? The love of God, the grace of God, the cross of Christ. The gospel is the good news of what God has done through Christ to save us from conditions to our participation in what has been provided through God's grace. But the gospel is the story of the grace of God. In fact, Paul calls it in Acts 20, the gospel of the grace of God. 
The message of the gospel is the message of God's activity, not our responsibilities. When you preach the gospel, the notion of human responsibility dawns on you pretty quickly and you start asking questions like Pentecost. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let me give you an illustration of that. About a year and a half ago, I was asked by a translation society to make some presentations in Moscow at a civic center on fundamentals of the Christian faith. And so we entitled the series, Things Christians Believe. It's a lecture, four nights. Night number one, why Christians believe in God. Night number two, what Christians believe... Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, night number two, what Christians believe about the Bible. Night number three, what Christians believe about Jesus. Night number four, what Christians believe about the life to which believers are called. Well... I wound up shifting the fourth night a, a, a little bit and, and talking more about how you organize and structure a church because I'd lecture for an hour and there'd be questions for an hour and after the first two nights and then the third night about Jesus, preaching gospel now. Belief in God, why scripture is normative, who Jesus is and what he's done. You know what the first question was in the question session of the third night? A gentleman in his early 70s, he and his wife had been there all three nights, he stood, he buttoned his coat, he put his pen into his, his, his coat pocket, and he asked, what must I do to be saved? If I needed personal vindication that if you preach the gospel, you get the kind of response that you see in the New Testament, I mean... That and other experiences like that have... have but, but, I mean, he asked it in the very same words, at least as, as through my translator. He said, his question is, what must I do to be saved? He's asking in Russian, of course. My Russian was not quite as good then as it is now. I know three or four words now. <laughs> as that question was discussed that night and in some more detail the next night, I, I considered those lectures really to be pre-evangelistic just laying the groundwork for what would happen later. Eleven were immersed in a swimming pool in a state sports complex on Saturday morning, and that group has grown to a little over 60 the last time I was there in July of this year. Whether it is in a mission setting or you know, Russia or Eastern Europe, wherever, there must be a shift of emphasis in our preaching, our presentation, our teaching away from law to gospel. But if you in fact attempt the preaching of gospel, and if you affirm the grace of God and, and preach the grace of God from Ephesians 2, from John 3, from any number of other passages, you will very often be heard by people as saying, oh, you don't believe that anybody has to repent then. You don't believe in baptism's essentiality, or you don't believe that the church is important. Well, that that sort of response can be had to the preaching of gospel indicates that the theology that we have been doing has apparently had some deficiency. Number three, another point of emphasis that I think must be made in order to communicate the gospel to this culture is we must r move from ritual to communication in our worship, from ritual to communication. Now, that entails lots of things. Can't talk about all of them. Let, let me talk about a couple. We have in our history and heritage affirmed the centrality of preaching, let's say, to our assemblies and to our worship. Now, believe me, I'm not against preaching, and I, you know, I don't want all the preachers fired, beheaded, drawn, and quartered. But in all honesty, I do not believe that preaching is meant to be the center and heart of our assemblies and our worship as the people of God. I believe the primary focus of worship needs to be around communion. A celebration of who Christ is and what he has done in the redemptive act that renews us and defines us as a people of covenant, just as the Passover meal identified Jewishness, so the communion meal identifies Christianness. In our assemblies, we have for several years now 
move to making the crescendo of every service be a celebration of the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper. Now, you know, some of the criticism that has been offered of us historically by uh, religious groups around us who hear our insistence on regular weekly participation in the Lord's Supper is, they say, well, what, the, the reason we don't do that and the reason why we think you guys are overdoing it is it'll become trivial. And, and you'll get to where it just doesn't have any meaning because of the frequency. Have you ever been able to admit the possible truthfulness of that? Have you ever in your experience been compelled to think, even if you wouldn't admit it out loud, you know, they're almost right the way we're doing it today. The sermon went a little long, so, you know, the brother who was going to preside at the table was going to read two or three scriptures to focus us, and there might was going to be a song, whatever. Well, we've got to cut that short because we're going to run over. So the guys line up, and quick prayer, and you pass it, quick prayer, and you pass it, and let's get the collection done too. Now, the Lord's Supper is mere ritual, one of those things that we believe to be important, as I do, and affirm the importance of weekly participation in. Then we have to get beyond ritual to the communication of the meaning of what we're doing. We've come almost to a sort of sacramentalism. When I'm sick, for example, I don't ask the brothers to bring me the wafers and the grape juice. I do not believe that communion, apart from the larger setting of worship, is a sacramental event. Ritual in communication is to think some about our music. You know, we're good at four-part harmonies, and, and we, we have our particular taste. Some churches are more high church, and they sing, you know, the, the great songs book, and the others are, you know, the, the songs of the church where there are a lot of stamps, Baxters, and, you know, we, we, we like to really get our toes to tap it. By the way, I hate stamps, Baxter music. But I tolerate it, because I don't think the music of the church always needs to be my taste in music. I'm not musically enough trained to, to, to have any strong theories about it, but I tell you one thing, if we forget for a moment great songs of the church and songs of the church, you know, the great classics, uh, Holy, 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 and I'll Fly Away. Now, boy, those are extremes. Let me tell you another kind of music that in this culture we need to give thought to communication and mere ritual, and that's contemporary Christian music. The last piece of Christ-exalting music was not written 120 years ago. Some were written 10 years ago, and some were written 3 years ago, and some are being written today. Some of the music that's done by Michael Card, or Michael W. Smith, or Amy Grant, or Sandy Patty. You say, well, they do that production with instrumental music, and we're an a cappella group, and I'm not for bringing them in. I'm not for bringing in instrumental music either. We are an a cappella fellowship. And I but that music that may be written and much of it produced and done with instruments, we can do a cappella. We do it. In our services, we use a good deal of contemporary Christian music. I don't think it ought to be either or. I think we need to continue using the best out of the traditional music of the church that we know. And for some of you, that would be very important. And if we didn't, you'd feel disenfranchised. You'd feel put upon. You might even go somewhere else to church. But people, listen to me. Please listen to me. There are some people younger than us disenfranchised with the music we know and that we're comfortable with. And if we would be offended that the music we know best, if that were thrown out, these kids feel offended and they are not communicated to without our sensitivity to allowing some of the music that is a part of their time and place and culture. A lot of those songs are just scriptures set to music. We sang two last night. Did you notice? They were just psalms set to music. Many of those are beautiful. There's a Wayne Watson song that uh, three of our people recently did in one of our services called Home Free. Someone introduced me to, knew I was going to, said, have you ever heard this Wayne Watson? I said, no, let me hear it. It was so powerful, better than anything in any of the books we use or any of the songs I know. Three people prepared that song and presented it in that assembly, not, you know, before we opened with announcements or after we closed with prayer. 
we, we do some really tricky and, pardon me, silly things sometimes, people. You know, to think, well, uh, we're, we're going to have the Columbia Christian Chorus over tonight uh, at the evening service, so we're going to have a 12-minute devotion on the closing prayer before they can sing. We're going to end our worship. You better not end your worship if these people are singing songs of praise to God and glorification to Jesus Christ. Because of what this is isn't worship, it's blasphemy. Somebody says, well, I tell you what, I'm, I'm against that sort of stuff because I think degenerate into entertainment. That's a legitimate caution to be sounded. But folks, tell me there's not some entertainment value in those Stamps Baxter songs. We've got to stand up and sing this one, folks. Uh, let's, let's all get on our feet, take a deep breath. Boy, this one, let, let's lift the rafters. Tell me there's not entertainment value to the music we've always sung. Of course there is. Tell me there's not entertainment value to preaching. Why would you rather listen to Preacher A than Preacher B? Preacher B is dry as powder. <laughs> he may be smarter and have much greater content than Preacher A, but Preacher A at least gets through to you because he may be able to make only one point in 30 minutes. This guy could make 20, but the one point he makes, oh, I got that. It didn't fly over my head. It wasn't dry and put me to sleep. People, there's entertainment value to life, if you want to use that term. I think we use it pejoratively in these discussions about music in the church. We want to say worship must be an entertainment something else. There is entertainment value to a good translation of Scripture. One reads better than another, and I can understand it. There's entertainment value to one preacher over another. Yeah, there may be entertainment value to music, any kind of music. That's not wrong. Now, if you let it degenerate merely to entertainment, that's wrong, whether it's the chorus coming in after you've had a closing prayer or whether it's three people presenting or nine people presenting. If you're just doing it to entertain, that's wrong. But people, the fact that something is interesting is probably a good sign that it's communicating. The fact that someone had rather hear that preacher or prefers that song or that method of presentation of that piece of music probably is a legitimation of its value. Listen to me on this point. I believe it's correct to say that if a given attempt at communication, whether it's spoken or musical or whatever, that if a given attempt at communication is not culturally relevant, it's wrong for the church to use it. And if we lock ourselves into period peace churches to where... You know, we won't use responsive readings. That looks denominational. Well, somebody said, you know, I don't, I don't want to do contemporary music. Denominational people use that. Well, shall we not do responsive readings? Or shall we not read a biblical text? Or shall we not have prayers? A shift away from ritual. This is what I've always known. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is the kind of music I grew up with. To what communicates and what is effective with the message. And let me say one other point, make one other point that falls out on generational lines. If you're as old as I am, I'm not a baby boomer. Missed it by a year. I'm part of the older generation. I'm 46. To my generation, you know what music basically was and is? Entertainment. Music's what I turn on when I'm driving down the road so I won't be bored. Music's what I turn on when I'm studying my Russian. Music's what my wife turns on when she's ironing or working in the kitchen. Sort of like distraction fills the dead air. You know what music is for my children? My children are 27 and 24 and 20. You know what music is to my children? It is the vehicle of truth for them. Music's much more important in the lives of my children than in my life. My children pick their music for very different reasons than I pick mine. I, I don't particularly pick music. I just turn it on. Well, if I don't like it, I might change. They go out and buy their music specific to a message they want to hear. And that's why some of us ought to be scared, given the music some of our kids bring home and the message that it has. Music is their vehicle of communication. If you're not concerned about the values of Madonna, because music is the primary bearer of value in our culture. And if you notice... Younger people look from you, and you'll notice they're sitting there and they're doing. Now, you know what they're doing, don't you? They're mouthing one of my sermon tapes. <laughs> they've listened to it so many times they've got it down, and they're just, their lips, no. Nah. It's somebody's music. 
They've listened to it over and over again and, and without setting out to memorize it, they have. And if they've memorized it, they've internalized it. When the government was lying to our folks and when values were falling apart and when racism was... Ebony and Ivory was coming across the radio and the kids were listening. Music is the bearer of truth for the younger generation. And listen to me. If you want to communicate to the baby boomer generation, if you want to communicate to the people who are younger than me, kids who are in their 30s, 20s, teens, you'd better not take so dogmatic and rigid a posture against the kind of music that you may not prefer and may not know. You'd better say, well, I want them to tolerate my tastes and keep some of these classics and favorites of mine, or even the Stamps Baxter ones. But I'm going to respect and tolerate their tastes and if this communicates with them as this does with me, I think there's place for both of us in the kingdom of God. Number four, and quickly, I'll just have to list these last two or three. Our emphasis was, must be not on conformity, but transformation. Not conformity within the group, but transformation by the power of the Spirit. I beseech you, but the mercies of God, not conform to this world, but I would even say, not even conform necessarily to the values of the group, but always being transformed by the Spirit of God. We have to be open to the Spirit of God. In fact, we have to develop a theology of the Holy Spirit. Many of us, if the truth were known, are Orthodox binatarians. The Father we know and the Son we know, but the Holy Spirit is sort of the disenfranchised member of the Godhead. And, and lest we become charismatics and Pentecostals, We've not wanted to teach about the Holy Spirit. We'd better teach about the Holy Spirit. He's the internal dynamic by which discipleship is worked out in the world and transformation happens. Number five, not fickleness, but faith. I mean by that absolute truth as revealed both in the person of Christ and in the statements, propositions, truths of Scripture once for all revealed. We cannot move away from the fact of Scripture and its authoritative and normative role. There may be better or less good ways of reading or doing hermeneutics. But I'm really not too interested to fuss about hermeneutics. I just want people in the text. Any hermeneutical method is better than none at all. The critical thing is to get people into this text so that God will be allowed to have his power at work in their lives. And number six, not syncretism, but evangelism. In the new wave movement and the influx of Eastern religions, more and more syncretism. You know, well, everything and you blend it. No, Christianity is an exclusive claim. Jesus Christ still says, I am the way, truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And the message that we give must still be the message of Christ. And then the seventh and final point. Not isolation, but hands-on ministry. Some of us have understood separation from the world to be basically isolationism. That mitigates the power of social justice issues. People, I remember, I remember the battle in the 60s over, say, the integration of schools in this country and how churches had to be drug in many parts of the country, north and south, east and west, to integrating churches. I was a student at a Christian college when it was announced in the spring with regret that in the fall we would be an integrated institution. The church must not be drug kicking and screaming by federal law into taking action for things that are right. The church must be on the cutting edge and out front. Jesus was. Let me close with this. A piece that a friend of mine wrote. Lord, so many times I find myself content with my religion. It's easy, compact, and all the pieces fit nicely together. But somewhere in the back of my heart, tucked away tight, you whisper to me. Gently you urge me towards a change of heart and a renewal of spirit. And I feel your presence and know the need for change. But I'm bound to my traditions and comfortable in my ways, yet you speak to me. 
You say that change is born in the heart and when full grown brings new life and renewal of life allows change to happen freely. Lord, I want that change of heart. I want to listen only to you. Take my will away. Words and give me a determination to carry out your will in my life. Take away the chains that bind me to my traditions and keep my spirit attuned to your will. Let me feel new life that's born of your spirit. Help me to see your will through open eyes. May the freedom of Christ break loose every chain. Lord, mold me daily in your image. And I believe that is the prayer for fundamental change of heart that will result in change in the way we see and do some things so that we'll do them more effectively. I believe that's the prayer we must learn to pray. Thank you for letting me be with you these two days. God bless you. Have a good day.